Me now. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to New Style Radio, where I am in the studio, Tony Kelly, with my special guest, the Honorable Counsel Wade Lynn. You heard him start off with one of his favorite tracks, My Boy Lollipop song by Millie Small, the late Millie Small from Jamaica, back in the day. I don't know who doesn't know that song. Even these youngsters should know My Boy Lollipop. But um, that's one on his playlist. You'll hear some others. I won't reveal what they are, but throughout the, um, the two-hour show, you'll hear other songs that Wade Lynn, Honorary Council in Birmingham, has chosen um, during various intervals as we go along. But let me start by welcoming the Honorable Wade Lynn. Um, Council General for the um, Jamaica High Commission here in Birmingham. Um, welcome. Good evening, Tony. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Mm -hmm. um, I have to just thank everybody for listening tonight, but also I'd like to thank everybody for um, saying a small prayer probably 12 months ago, obviously when I went into hospital on the 2nd of April, uh, and I didn't return to the general public to the 3rd of July. But, you know, a big thank you for everybody who actually prayed for me while I was, I would class it um, in my big sleep. But more so, we'll tell you more about that later. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that, that's the, one of the main reasons for having you on the show, Wade, to talk about um, your hospital stay, COVID-19, and the urgence of us within the black community to take the vaccine, all right? So, as I said, welcome to Wadelin. I should have given you your proper titles, um, CBE, which is um, Commander of the British Empire, and also CD, Order of Distinction in the rank of Commander. That's an honor Wadelin has had from Jamaica. So, it's so good to have you in the New Style Radio studio, um, and we hope to have some conversation going on here. Um, so. I'm going to start by asking, some of us do know Wade Lynn very well. Some might refer to you as the Patty King, <laughs> but some others know you in other settings. For listeners who might be new to you and haven't heard your name before, Wade Lynn, start off by telling us a bit about your early upbringing and childhood. I'll leave that open-ended for you to just go into it. Tell us about your early upbringing and childhood, Wade. Yes, um, for me, I came to the UK from Jamaica way back in 1966. You probably remember 1966 as the year that England won the World well, Cup. Uh, my parents came here in the early 60s um, and left me at a tender age of one in Jamaica. Um, and that's where I grew up on a, a very famous street called King Street in Kingston. Um, and I grew up with my auntie, he grew me up um, there. And obviously when my parents were a little bit, um, had saved up enough money, they sent for me on a, on a British Airways uh, aircraft. Um, and I'd come here with a little suitcase and a little tag round your neck with your name on. Uh -huh. So I can I can remember that I just went to the airport and for the for the um, older people of of our community, everybody loves to go to the airport to see somebody off. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, it was a big thing, you know, up into the nineties where all the family would go to the airport, escort you to the gate, and watch the plane fly off. So. That was my upbringing. Um, I came to actually Birmingham here. My parents lived on a famous street called Marshall Street in Smethwick. Mm -hmm. um, some of you may remember Marshall Street or Malcolm X came here mm -hmm. in 1965. I wasn't here at the time, so I didn't actually uh, see him, but it's a famous street. And that's where I grew up. Um, I went to a school locally uh, in Smethwick called Devonshire Road Junior School and then I went on to Smethwick Hall Boys School. Um, uh, the school is still there now at uh, Smethwick Hall High, S High School is still there. Uh, wow. And then I went to the technical college that used to be Chances in the, just off the high street 
and then on to Worley College. Now, Worley, Worley College is actually still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was my early years um, living in Birmingham, and that's all I knew. But in the meantime, a lot of people who may know me or may know my parents, mm -hmm. we had a petrol station, a mobile petrol station, in the 70s on Smethwick High Street. Um, for me, that was a fabulous experience. Um, I'm growing up when you're 15, 16, mm -hmm. um, your parents have a petrol station. It was, I didn't know that, but for me, it was just a, a natural thing. And one thing it taught me was, um, uh, as you as you grow up, you have to do your your work at home. So, mm. my mum would cook the uh, brown the chicken in the morning, mm -hmm. and my job in the evening would come in and brown the chicken, mm -hmm. make the gravy, and then I'd get ready and go down and work at my father's petrol station, which was in walking distance from home, probably ten minutes walk. So. Those are my early years growing up in Smethwick. Um, now that petrol station that we sold up in the early 80s is now a, a tyre place. Okay. And it's on the bypass, um, just down the road from the COVID testing station, which oh, is on Smethwick High Street. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that appropriate? But tell me something here. You said a mobile petrol station. A oh, mobile, mobile. Mobile, oh, mobile. Not okay. mobile, mobile. Mobile, okay. <laughs> I'm glad I asked that question because I thought, well, what's a mobile? But, but it's mobile, yes, as you have Texaco yeah. and, and um, all the others that are around as well, and BP and Shell and so on. Okay. So, uh, am I to understand then, with your parents having left you in Jamaica and they came here, um, are you an only child? No, no. I have a number of brothers and sisters. Mm. Um, at the time um, I came here, uh, I had a sister that was born in right. the 60s here, my little sister Debbie. Right. I've got an older brother, Ripton, mm -hmm. and an older sister, uh, Rose, right. or Jackie, mm -hmm. and they both live here now. I've mm -hmm. then got an older sister and an older brother, mm -hmm. Jean and Tony. Okay. And then uh, my brother Roy, who came here uh -huh. uh, probably in the 70s, mm -hmm. he passed away here and he's, he's buried at what we might call the Boundary Cemetery. cemetery which is Hansworth Cemetery for Hansworth those who cemetery, don't, don't yes. know. Well, well let me, um, you spoke a bit about your childhood. Let me then ask you, uh, I'm curious about the surname Lynn, L-Y-N. Um, tell us a bit about that in terms of your family history upbringing. Um, my family history, Lynn is a Chinese name. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my great-grandfather um, escaped um, the Chinese Revolution way back in the 20s and came to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So that's my name, Lin, but I'm not certain whether it could have been Cox Lin or we dropped the first part off and have just Lin. Lin right. So that's how my, uh, my surname, Lin, L-Y-N, not L-I-N. Yes, uh, yes. In Smedic, and you sort of... Home to Smethwick in New Style Radio Studio, which is on the Dudley Road, for those who don't know. Um, taking us on to, um, as I said at the very start, you're known in some quarters in the food industry as um, whether the patty king or a patty business or so on. T tell us about how the starting of that company came about, because it's, it's famous now, um, and what, what products you make there at the... the Patty, please. Um, the the patty. Well, I should say my company, Cleone Foods, is the food manufacturing company. And Island Delight is a brand name right. that uh, everybody sees us in the supermarketers, and we sometimes call Island Patties. Um, that's been going for thirty years now wow. since nineteen eighty nine, mm -hmm. um, and our fortunate was to. Worked for a company in Wolverhampton after leaving university called Comlon Caterers, mm -hmm. and they were in Cross Street North. They're now um, that company is now called the Original Patty Company, and they're mm -hmm. still in the same location. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I left university with a Bachelor of Education degree, I worked for my uh, good friend of the family called Mr. Young mm -hmm. um, as the manager there to build that business up for him. I saw an opportunity um, around about 1986, 87, um, 
and I had a small loan from my father mm -hmm. of 4850 to actually set up the company. Wow. After the riots on Rookery Road. So in the mid-80s, mid-80s, we had the uprising along uh, oh. Rookery Road and there mm -hmm. was a, a number of uh, rioters up there. Um, and I set the first part of the food manufacturing company in a place called Alma Street, which is behind Newtown Shopping Centre. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was my first appearance, but the company Wolverhampton really taught me uh, about the patty market. But for me, uh, my ambition was to bring patties to the mass market. Right. Uh -huh. Not to the local shops. Right. Okay. And you've, you've done that. So... Um, from small beginnings, oak trees grow into, um, from acorns, they grow into oak trees. And here you are now in 2021 with a very thriving business, which a lot of people know about on the corner of um, it, the, the Hockley roundabout there. T tell us where you are now. How many people you employ? Is it a diverse company, ethnic makeup, gender, and so on. What's the makeup of the firm, Cleon Foods Limited, like now? Um, we employ around 70 people. Um, we operate from 6 o'clock in the morning till probably 11 o'clock at night. We've got two shifts a day. Mm -hmm. We produce anything from 140,000 patties a week to 160 to 220,000 patties a week, wow. depending on orders. Um and our makeup of our workforce is uh, really, um, I could say that we've got English, Cubans, um, Europeans, Polish, mm -hmm. um, North African, mm -hmm. Afro-Caribbean. Mm -hmm. We've got um, people from Martinique. Um, so we really employ anybody who has the right capability and the right skills to work with us. Um, it's a very much of a diverse, diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. um, the senior management team, uh, are the women outnumber the men on the board. Wow, that's good um, to hear. Mm -hmm. so, so that's mm -hmm. very rare. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to always try as best as possible to employ the best person that comes for the interview. Right. Now, mm -hmm. for most people that doesn't understand that, you might want the people of colour to work for you, mm -hmm. but if they don't turn up or nobody turns up for that particular interview, mm -hmm. you have to employ mm -hmm. you have to employ whoever turns up for that particular Indeed. interview. Mm -hmm. So, although you'd like to employ people of, of your colour mm -hmm. from Jamaica or whatever, they might not have the right set skills mm -hmm. and they would have already been employed in local authority or other establishments. Right. But I, I do like it's quite an eclectic or a diverse mix. Or It's in effect the United Nations. You mentioned Poland, Africa, um, the Caribbean, people from all war, war, walks of life. And that's good to hear because I won't name any companies around, but there's several companies around that are so um, narrow-minded in their whole approach to employing people that they only employ people from their ethnic background. And that, for me, is a shame because that takes away the whole diversity, which is what we're trying to aim for. So that, that's pleasing to hear. Well, I have visited the company on many occasions, which is why I made sure to ask the question. And I do see um, a rainbow effect, eclectic, uh, multinational, um, multi-ethnic group that's there. But I forgot to mention the Asians. I do have some Asians in the business as well. Yes. From <laughs> India and Pakistan <laughs> also. Well, that's good. So, good. so let's, let's get that clear. Okay, yes, it's, good, it's, on, good on yeah. you. Yes, yeah. you don't discriminate in any way or no. form in that regard. <laughs> okay. Um, so, in the truest sense of the word, um, you're well known for, because I know of you from lots of community involvement and so on, um, for giving back to the community. Um, please give us some insight into your community involvement over the years and why it remains a passion of yours. Um, I think that the main thing about giving back is I, I come from a place called Clarendon, uh, a small place called Chapleton in Clarendon. Um, and it's a small, I couldn't call a small village, but it's... 
if you look at the Phillips map of Jamaica, Chapleton comes up as a as a big lettering town. So right. it's a big place, and we've got a, a town square. Um, so for me, um, helping people locally comes natural to me. Um, in COVID times, you can't pick up any anybody on the side of the road. So let's get that clear. <laughs> you have to drive past. Uh, from the once a uh, lift, you have to drive past. But for me, uh, giving back is all part of just helping each other. Mm -hmm. um, I've been on various boards, so I have been on the, the local let partnership when it was first started. I did work uh, previously with. Advantage West Midlands uh, with my colleague Monica Coke when she was she was there also. Um, I do sit on a local charity boards in um, one in West Bromwich, Crete Green for the last uh, fifteen years, um, and the other uh, group that I all we all sit as as Black Entrepreneur is the Twelve Eight Group. That's probably been going about 18 years. It's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring group. Oh, mm -hmm. Myself, Errol from Sunrise Bakery. Bakery. You've got Dennis and Ian from A&I. A um, there used to be uh, um, Andy Bailey was there from the mm -hmm. computer company. So as best as possible, we try and help each other, yeah, uh, yeah. however small. Um, I see myself as a door opener mm -hmm. to open the doors for other people who may be in business, may not be in my field, but be in other mm -hmm. field, but may need um, a little pointer mm -hmm. to say, you know, how would you go about this? So I see myself as to help other people mm -hmm. um, in the community um, just to move to the next level. Right. And that's pleasing to hear because some, sometimes you hear the well-known Shakespearean um, phrase, which is in one of his um, plays, scorning the base degrees by which one did ascend. You, you certainly don't come across as that person, type of person at all. The giving back is so important. Um, some people just think, no, I've reached where I've gotten to now, so uh, um, forget about those who are there fighting behind me to come. But you're certainly not that sort of person. And that, that for me, s sends out a quite clear message. Um, I know you're very modest and very humble, Wade, but when I visit your business, um, Cleon Foods in Hockley, I can't but notice you have a big cabinet there um, when you come into the main entrance, and the, the, there's absolutely loads of awards and trophies and cups and so on. Give, give us a flavour of what those are all about. How, how have you managed to whether be presented with these? Um, because um, it's an it's an array. It it it, it would match Man United's um, <laughs> trophy cabinet. <laughs> Almost. I've um, got the players. <laughs> um, uh, just a flavour. I mean, in 1993, I had a, a best business award. Mm -hmm. Way back in 1993, in the year 2000, I did I had an inner city hundred growth award. Mm -hmm. um, because I invested my people, I took the investors in people in 2002. Mm -hmm. In 2006, we had the Caribbean Food Association Manufacturer of the Year. In 2009, we entered the BITC, Business in the Community, right. Small Company of the Year, and got reaccredited re in 2010. Um, we won the 2012 best small business company in the UK Wow! Mm -hmm. um, as a small business. So as a small business, you have to have under uh, 250 50 people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in 2013, I received a CBE uh, from the Queen for the contribution to industry. Mm -hmm. um, in 2013, I was handed the Honorary Consul for Jamaica in Birmingham. I have to make clear that the honorary consul does not get paid by the Jamaican government. Right. It's an honorary post mm -hmm. that always costs me mm -hmm. and the company money right. to actually run the office. So mm -hmm. the service that I provide, or I should say the team of volunteers provide, mm -hmm. is, is for the benefit of the community mm -hmm. and we are doing something for our Jamaican community. Okay. Well, that's, that's pleasing to hear. Um, 
uh, before we go to a little break, just just tell me. I think you've gotten, as I said at the very beginning of the of the interview, the um, order of distinction in the rank of commander. This is from the Jamaican government. Wh what year did that come your way? Um, that came in August 2020. Oh, fairly recently. So then. that's very recently, and I've got a new award that took place on the 1st of April this year. I'm now made a deputy lieutenant. Oh, congratulations. So that's a DL. Of the West, of the West Midlands. Uh, in the West Midlands. Midlands. So right. each mm. DL has a particular area to cover. Mm. So I cover the DL. Now, what the DL means is a deputy lord lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Now, you have the vice lord lieutenant, which is the Queen's representative. Right. So the DL is is there in the local community mm -hmm. to support the Lord Lieutenant. So on state occasions, so you might have um, in November where the Lord Lieutenant would be at the, the um, raising of the flag, flag. Mm -hmm. um, on the 11th, closest to the 11th of November. Right. Mm -hmm. But the other... DLs mm -hmm. would be at other engagements right. around the area. Right, I see. Okay, I think on that note, we'll stop there for a while, we'll pause for a while and play your next track, which is called Young, Gifted and Black. Broadcasting across the city on 98.7 FM. New, 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 new style radio. Ah, uh, hello everybody. Listeners and viewers, welcome back to New Style Radio. We're your host for the most days to date, six till eight, is Tony Kelly from the community. Not well known in these parts of the world, but um, I've been asked to um, be host for this show where I have Honourable Councillor um, Wade Lynn in the studio talking to us about his experiences. We're going to come on to COVID because that's one of the main reasons for getting Wade into the studio. He has a story to tell about COVID. So if listeners want to ring at any point and have any questions they want to ask of Wade Lynn, um, the number is 0121 Two seven zero two five five nine. And before the adverts came on, you were listening to Young, Gifted and Black by Marcia Griffiths, who used to sing with the I-3s back in the day. Um, that was Wade's second choice. So, Wade, we're coming back to... Um, you did mention in the break about your work with the Duke of Edinburgh, um, who has sadly passed away recently. Tell us a bit more about that, the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and your involvement, having probably met him as well. Um, way back when I was uh, back at Smethical Boys School, and I think um, I did the bronze, the silver and the gold Duke of Edinburgh. And if you were fortunate to the gold Duke of Edinburgh, you could go down to Buckingham Palace right. and you could select one of your parents. So at that time, my dad said to mom, you can go down to Buckingham Palace wow. with myself. Um, and that was the first time I went to Buckingham Palace um, but I also did the Duke of Edinburgh Award uh, gold, and you had to do 50 miles of um, walking in uh, what we call mountainous country. So I did my 50-mile walk in, in the Snowdonian region. Uh, and I can always remember, you can only do four miles on a normal road, or a, uh, but the rest of the, the 46 miles must be, must be on mountainous country uh, and it taught me how to read an audience survey map of the contours that go up the mountain and down the mountain and you had to do that over four nights five days and you'd have to climb possibly up to 2,000 meters so I can remember camping out on the side of a mountain at night in wow. the sleeping bag. And, and this was done with the company of others. It was a group of you. Yes, there Not were four your... of us mm -hmm. having to go uh, together and we all had to map room. We carried our own uh, rucksack round and you had uh, an instructor that would would oversee us at night time or in the day while we walked. But that was an experience that I enjoyed. Um, and then obviously later on, I went to... Uh, a climb to base camp uh, way back in 2017, uh, Mount Everest that is, Mount Everest Mount base camp. So my love of uh, walking came about then, but my also uh, passion for doing um, sort of community work 
as part of Duke of Edinburgh, you had to do some community work. So I can remember working, um, volunteering at a place on Lick, Little Moor Hill Road, not mm -hmm. far from Devonshire Road, at a, um, a community at a home there. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to go there for uh, two or three hours each week, and do a little bit of um, helping out. Wow! Before we go any further, Wade, I can see a book somewhere in there. Memoirs need to be told, so the next generation coming up can realize. Um, how, how, all the things you've done and are continuing to do um, within the community and further afield. And, and I like the walking bit, because I will add, as somebody who is into a lot of walking, health and well-being, we need to encourage our communities to do a lot more walking. Get, we, none of us were born in a motor car, OK? So let's start from that point. So why we have to take the car, we're going 400 yards down the road, our feet were made for walking. So that, that's good to hear, and um, that, that's a lovely story to tell. Um, let, let's move on then, Wade. Um, we, we've been speaking about the business and your community. You did touch on the mayor's deputy lieutenant's role. So I, I, in essence, I'm understanding then, if the, the lieutenant is not available for an engagement, you are next in line to, to, do, to do it. That is correct. So right. there's a number of us. Um, I cover Birmingham area. Mm -hmm. um, we've got um, another another gentleman called Martin Livermore who covers the Wolverhampton okay, area. Right. We have other lieutenancy that covers Warwickshire I and see. Coventry. Mm -hmm. So there's various lieutenancies. So how it works is that you could write a request um, to Buckingham Palace to have... A rep the Queen to come to your event. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Queen can't make it to your event, they will send a Deputy Lieutenant or the Lord Lieutenant. Uh -huh. I see. Right. I'm going to touch on something which I do know about. you. This isn't in the questions I had intended to ask you, but since we're touching this area, let me then ask you about you have a chaplain. I think Dr. Bishop Joe Aldred is here. That's chaplain. correct. Tell um, us a bit why you have to have a chaplain <laughs> chaperoning you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, because of the COVID, um, I should have took up another government ap appointment, which is would have been the, um, the High Sheriff of the West Midlands. Right. So last year, on the 7th of April, I should have took up my year mm -hmm. as the High Sheriff of the West Midlands. Now, as the High Sheriff, it's a bit like... If most people know Robin Hood and mm -hmm. the Sheriff of Nottingham, mm -hmm. the Sheriff is the legal representative of the, the Crown, the Queen. Mm -hmm. So the High Sheriff represents anything to do with the courts. Right. And as the High Sheriff, you have to look after any judges... Uh, which come up from London and they're normally a sir or a dame um, and they're high court judges and they're the ones that are in red. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And your duty would be is to feed, clothe and entertain mm -hmm. them and provide security when they were here. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's more of a ceremonial role now right, I see. Mm -hmm. in before 1884 <clears throat> it used to be more so that you, your role is financial so you are not paid for that role but you have to feed the clothes and provide security for mm -hmm. the high court judges in your area mm -hmm. and you would have to um, uh, pay for all of those items out of your pocket I see, right Okay. Let's move on now to um, sort of current times. The pandemic started on the 20th, um, or the lockdown, I should say, started on the 23rd of March. Boris Johnson announced to um, everybody in Britain that, hey, as of midnight on the 23rd of March, we're going to go into what was in our first lockdown. So without giving too much away about yourself and so on, how did that impact and affect 
you as a person and your business, because I heard you say earlier you didn't go to hospital until April, so we'll come on to that. But how did locking down, yes, you are a supplier of food to various supermarkets and, and other business outlets, how did that affect you, your staff, etc., trying to work and prepare food in these conditions of socializing, two meters apart, social distancing, and so on? Um, it, uh, it affected the business slightly differently to most business. So we had to prepare for the lockdown. So my job was to sign all anybody's letters mm -hmm. that they may have been stopped by the police or anybody working for the government okay. to understand that why are you on the bus or why are you walking Essential to work? Essential workers. Yes. Mm. So one of the key things is we took the steps that the government has signed all the letters. Um, one of the issues that the staff had, they were saying, well, we can't go shopping, Mr Lynn, mm -hmm. while we're working because uh, I didn't lay any staff off throughout the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so we were on full production because, as we all know, the shelves mm -hmm. went empty for toilet rolls and those essential items. So what I did as the owner, I went and bought toilet rolls from the wholesale for my staff, mm -hmm. uh, sanitising gel, so they had those items okay. so they could travel to work and face masks and rubber gloves. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. This is how a true business person operates, making sure to look after um, the, the staff along the way. So those are all the, the good things that you are doing there. So here you are going about your life, um, and then suddenly um, symptoms start arriving or you start feeling unwell at work. T take us through that period and what eventually led to you seeking help. Because if I can very briefly say, Men don't do doctors. Men are into denial. Men bury their head in the sand. This is a, I'm saying this to all the listeners out there, the wives and the partners and girlfriends who have men in their life. They're not the sort who will say, OK, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go get sorted out. Take us through all that period which led to eventually somebody suggesting you need to go and seek medical advice. That's what <coughs> men did. Yeah, so... I took sick round about the 23rd of April. Uh, sorry, March, March, sorry. Um, I had a bit of a cold, and as, as Tony was saying, I had a bit of a cold. I didn't call the doctor. Mm -hmm. I decided to um, take a whole Jamaican <laughs> remedy, yes, the rum and honey. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Dissolved two paracetamol in orange <laughs> juice, had yeah. a cup full of rum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bearing in mind you don't take any other medication. Uh, and I decided to feed the cold at that stage. Um, I wasn't aware of where I picked up the virus, so let's get that clear. Um, so I took the first week off from, the, um, from about the 24th of, of um, March. And I went home... Um, and I've got to say, uh, at the end of that week, um, I, I, com I then was back at home. Um, so the, the 23rd was on a Sunday, mm -hmm. and then um, the 28th was on the Saturday. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got to, I've, to say to all the listeners, from that, the 28th, I can find myself to home. Mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, perspiring at night, mm -hmm. uh, getting up. Um, I then started to have the runs on the Monday. I called the doctor, and at these times you can't go and see the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, he asked me all the symptoms of your loss of taste, mm -hmm. uh, what, and I explained to him on the phone I've got loss of taste, and uh, at that stage I didn't have a test for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Um, I then said, shall I, you know, call the ambulance and said, well, you're not sick enough yet. Um, call me back in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, I then called 111 on the Tuesday right. um, of that week. Um, and they said, well, you, you haven't shown symptoms. Um, if your symptoms persist, then call us back. So that was the 31st now. So that was um, the Tuesday the 31st. Mm -hmm. um, I still 
was feeling a little bit lightheaded. Um, I had I had um, a blood pressure machine at home, and I also had um, uh, a thermometer to take my temperature, and that was all recorded down. Um, but the thing that probably helped me was the oximeter. Uh, for most people, don't understand what the oximeter is. It's where you put your finger in and measure the the oxygen level in your blood. Oh, I see. Mm. So when you do go to the hospital and they take your blood pressure on your right arm or your left arm, mm -hmm. you have your finger placed in the oximeter. Um, so what then took place, obviously, my lungs were filling up with um, water. Um, and I was on a liquid diet of soup or things like that. Um, and then I took... Uh, worse on the 2nd of April uh, whereby I had a bit of tummy problem I had the runs um, and then um, I just wanted to go to sleep so uh, the ambulance was called and I can't remember anything after the after Wednesday that. all I can remember was going to the toilet and I had an accident of the runs mm -hmm. um, the ambulance was called um, and I had um, what you call hypoxia at that stage where um, you want to go to sleep. Um, my oxygen levels is now in the 80s. Mm -hmm. If you measure oxygen now with an oximeter, it's above 95. Mm -hmm. So I was in the 80s. So the ambulance came to my home. Um, they um, uh, took everything, they took the precautions. I can't remember anything. Um, they took me down to the ambulance. My sister arrived at my home mm -hmm. and apparently I did wave to her. Right. So I waved to my sister and I can't remember none Nothing. of that. But who called the ambulance in the first place? Was it you who called? No, I didn't call. Somebody came round to check on me because I oh, had to I be see. checked twice, twice a, day, a day. Yeah, right. Because mm. I, I stand me on. Right. So, mm. so somebody came round to check on me and they kindly checked on me and said, no, mm. you're now at a stage that... That, that you need assistance. Mm -hmm. I then went to the hospital on the 2nd of April, that was a Thursday, mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember going to the hospital, um, being taken at hospital, taken mm -hmm. in. I then was asked to make six phone calls to my relatives. I can't remember the six people I called. I only mm -hmm. looked up the numbers only last week. week. Okay. So mm. I called my two sisters. Mm -hmm. I called. Uh, I did call Monica, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I called two other people, two or three mm -hmm. other people, um, and I did remember they said um, that they're going to put me into a coma for five weeks. Wow. So they had to put me on so a it's vent. an induced coma. An induced coma. Wow. Um, and I did speak to everybody who, who I spoke to and they, they wrung each other because they thought, did he say five days or, or five, five weeks? weeks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, uh, I had, I've got a scar where they had to cut my throat so, um, and they had to put a trachecostomy down. To aid your breathing. To aid my breathing. Mm -hmm. At that stage, I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. so, of it. Mm -hmm. so I would class that I was in my deep sleep yeah, right. uh -huh. um, and all I can remember was uh, well I can't re all I can remember was just having a sleep mm -hmm. I call it my deep sleep mm -hmm. um, I didn't wake so up in this deep sleep um, for however how long that was were you feeling any pain? I didn't feel any pain mm -hmm. I had dreams I right. could dream things mm -hmm. So I had dreams that I was on a train in New York. I remember dreaming about relatives that lived in this, New York. This is your life flashing by in front of <laughs> well, you? Well, in really? theory, yes. yes. Uh -huh. yes. Um, mm -hmm. Flashing by. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I can remember that um, I think my hand fell out of a trolley and I was brushed against something in the hospital somewhere. Mm -hmm. While I was on the ventilator, um, there were four occasions where um, the doctors rang my daughter to say, um, we have to tell you the bad news, your dad's got 48 hours to live. You're, are you Are you serious? I'm very serious. Wow. Uh, um, how did your daughter, let me just, just put aside and say, how, how did your daughter, because of course you're out now, 
How, how did she take hearing that? that, that not... Well, we haven't really spoke on that, but the, the issue was everybody wanted to know how I was doing. Oh, yes, because mm. there were lots of rumours in the, in the community. I'm a community person yeah. and people would say, meet me on the street, did you know Wade's in hospital, he's on a ventilator, he's in intensive care and so on. But of course, um, I, and I tried to avoid, Monica Koch, who works with you, and everybody knows Monica, she was being bombarded with, with calls. I said, what's happening to Wade now and where he is? But all I was saying to people is, prayers, prayers, and more prayers. If you're from a Christian upbringing or what have you, pray, pray for Wade's recovery. He's, he's, in, a, he's in a bad place. So I've got to thank everybody for praying mm -hmm. for me because I'm here to tell the story. Sorry, yes. But I'm here also to save other people people's lives from, from the situation. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, and I've got to explain to everybody, you, if you ever get to this situation, mm -hmm. your organs may and Back will in. fail. Mm -hmm. So I had heart failure, I had lung failure, I had kidney failure. Let's understand that. Right. And I had dialysis as well. Mm -hmm. They also had to turn me over every 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So some people go into hospital on their back, mm -hmm. but I recovered better when I was turned over and put onto my stomach. stomach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that started to get the, the water out, out of, of my lungs. lungs. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it was very early days in April that we didn't know how... Um, people were going to survive. Mm -hmm. um, fortunate for me, maybe because I didn't, I don't drink or I don't smoke. Right. Mm -hmm. I was fairly fit. I'm not that overweight, mm -hmm. and I don't suffer from diabetes. I was going to ask you, uh, were there any underlying health no. issues that you had, which could have exacerbated no. your situation? So no, I don't have any diabetes. I've raised blood pressure. Yes, but because I had a, a mild stroke mm -hmm. uh, some five years ago. Um, so, and I think that's my to save me. I took on board my vitamin D when I went to Jamaica Becca, in February indeed, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, so I could say that the people that pray for me, that I haven't gone to church, I just want to say thank you for mm -hmm. your prayers at that time. Mm -hmm. And I finally woke up around about, the 15th of May. 15th of May? Yeah. From what was an admission from... The 2nd of, of April. April. Wow. Mm. So, I know some people out there don't believe that this uh, coronavirus uh, doesn't exist, but mm -hmm. obviously it, it, ex it, it, it existed, yeah. and I'm here to tell the tale. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. So, um... Let me then just ask you, the, uh, I think it was a question, I should have asked it earlier, about the oximeter. Is that something that people can buy at any yes. of the chemists? Or you, you can it? buy at the chemists. They're available now. Mm -hmm. um, and we bought, uh, I bought one home for myself. Mm -hmm. um, a true story, I spoke to somebody in uh, America mm -hmm. and they went and bought one for them, their family, but mm -hmm. they bought one to somebody else father had a problem okay he had an oximeter checked it mm -hmm. and they bought it the same day the next day he went to hospital and oh. saved his life right, right. Okay. so the mm -hmm. oximeter basically measures the oxygen in your bloodstream mm -hmm. and normally it measures between 95 and 98 but there's no pricking of any finger you just no. put the device onto you just your put the device on, onto your finger and then it does the, the measurement and it, and it does the measurements right okay mm -hmm. um so the ones you buy in the shops may be two or three um points out right so mine reads at home be 96 97 possibly 98 mm -hmm. and they're available on the internet and possibly mm -hmm. for about 10 to 15 pounds so mm -hmm. If I had to say, if you had to buy something, buy yourself mm -hmm. an oximeter, and if you are feeling ill with mm -hmm. COVID, put your finger in there and just mm -hmm. check your oximeter. Yes. So uh, I give those away as presents. I, 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 yes, I, I, I like that advice because, yes, you can ring 111, which we're told to ring, and you can tell the person on the end of the phone your symptoms or so on. But if you already have something like an oximeter or you can take your your own temperature and you notice it's raised or somebody in the family has has something to take the temperature um then those are things you can feed in straight away to the person um because i, I take the view nobody knows your body better than you yes, do and that's very important 
Wow. So up until the 5th of May, there you are in, in, in an induced coma, and the world's going by, and you're none the wiser what's happening out there. Um, um, take us on f from there, because as I said, the news was traveling f wide yeah. and fast through the community. So, so my daughter really couldn't report to anybody because she didn't know much. Mm -hmm. So the hospital would contact her maybe once a day to say, your, your dad is obviously still on the ventilator. But she couldn't visit. She couldn't visit. visit. Yeah, that's important to know. And mm -hmm. I have to tell everybody mm -hmm. that if you are hospitalised in these times, mm -hmm. your relatives can't visit. visit. No. Mm -hmm. I know a few weeks ago relatives can visit mm -hmm. when in wards the non-COVID, right. but they don't want people visiting and catching that COVID Right. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, obviously, um, she had to take the world on her shoulders and everybody was calling in to find out mm -hmm. how I'm doing. But she couldn't report anything from day to day because I was just laid up with yes. tubes around me um, and with, with, mm -hmm. with the people from the NHS. Mm -hmm. But I've got to thank the, the nurses and the doctors that, you know, did they work on me? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I've got the scars um, to, show it. Mm. to show it, but without the service of, of the NHS, and you have to understand mm -hmm. that the people in the NHS working at this time were on the front line. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and they also took what I call the hit mm -hmm. and the number of them. Okay. We're going to stop here for a moment and we're going to go to um, the news at seven. Um, courtesy of our technicians here operating, Soka Master and, um, and his team. New Star Radio, New Star Radio, 98.7 FM. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's the new Star! Broadcasting across the city on 98.7 FM. New, 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 new style radio. Welcome back to New Style Radio, where I, the host for the evening, Tony Kelly, is interviewing the Honorary Council Wade Lynn from Birmingham here about his near-death experience in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital as a result of contracting or getting COVID-19 and how it laid him low. Now, we're going to go into his next track, and you'll notice a theme going. This one is from the iconic Jimmy Cliff, Many Rivers to Cross. Hello, New Style Radio listeners and viewers, for that matter. Um, that was the iconic Jimmy Cliff song, Many Rivers to Cross, which was featured in the um, Harder They Come. Now, I'm here just reminding viewers and listeners, if you want to ask any questions of our special guest, the Honourable Counsel Wade Lynn, the number to call in the studio here is 0121-270-2559. That's New Style Radio 98.7 FM. So let's continue the discussion. We have about another 50 minutes or so to go, away, and hopefully it's, a couple of viewers might decide to give us a call in. Let me ask you an all-important question now. Are you actually COVID-free? Or do you have what we call long COVID, where people have certain um, things happening to them, um, even though they've, they've, they've recovered? Um, <clears throat> I've got two issues here. Uh, when I did come out of hospital on the 3rd of July, mm -hmm. um, well, I should say, when I woke up from a big sleep mm -hmm. in May, um, I was given a phone, a mobile phone, mm -hmm. Imagine that you can't pick up your mobile phone. Oh, right. Wow. So, when you go into a coma, the first five days doesn't affect your muscles. Mm -hmm. From day six upwards, your muscles start to disintegrate gradually. So, obviously, you hear about that gentleman and his wife works for um, Breakfast TV... Yes. On ITV. Yes. He's mm -hmm. obviously been in hospital over 12 months. months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like learning to walk, walk again. Mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So when I left hospital, I couldn't even get out of bed. Wow. Because my muscles were wasted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's been on a ventilator. Um, long COVID, I still do struggle with long COVID. So if you've had it, you get the tingling in your feet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and at night time, your feet would tingle, your left foot or your right foot would tingle. Um, I had to take a driving test when I came out of hospital because really? I, I had uh, a bleed on the brain, mm -hmm. so I had to make sure that I was fit to drive. Um, but you can't, when you if you get COVID at all, you uh, get debilitated and mm -hmm. you can't really do a full day's work. Mm -hmm. So you can manage three, four, five, maybe six hours, and then after fatigue that... Fatigue sets in. Fatigue sets, sets in. in. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. to me, I could do two, three hours and then have to have a little lie down and have a sleep. Well, Bob, it's a good thing you have quite a supportive backup um, set of staff at, 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 at your place of work yeah. who could carry on. Because um, let's face it, nobody's indispensable. Um, people have to carry on with, with running the business. But then let me take you through. You were at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. I think I know this, but let the viewers know, and you, you're not able to walk, where did you go for rehabilitation? I went to the Stroke Rehabilitation Unit at um, in Mosley Hall, Wow. Um, and uh, fortunate, the, uh, I was in Ward 9 mm -hmm. and there were only 26 patients there. Mm -hmm. um, and when you are admitted to that particular hospital, you're isolated in a single room on your own mm -hmm. to check if you had COVID. Right. And you had to stay there for five days um, and you were swabbed to check until you were COVID-free right. before you could enter award with four other people on your ward so uh -huh. each room had four people uh -huh. um and my stay there i can remember a gentleman who had a track cost to me uh -huh. um and he was like that for the whole entire period of the five weeks i was there and when i left he was still there yeah. mm -hmm. um I should go back to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital before I left. Mm -hmm. um, when I did wake, um, I was full. I was in a ward of, I think there were six beds because mm -hmm. it was a four-bed ward, but they'd fit an extra two in. Mm -hmm. And I have to say there was, I was a black person. There was a Chinese gentleman mm -hmm. who was at, uh, came from... Um, the private hospital and was in that that ward mm -hmm. and the rest were asians right. mm -hmm. i did ask the question while i was at the qe mm -hmm. how many men how many women were in this ward there were mm -hmm. 20 bed ward there were 19 men and one woman wow mm -hmm. so that's let's let's get into perspective yes that's a worrying it statistic. will affect mm -hmm. more men and than it will, will affect women, women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you something. We said earlier about, you, on the whole, you were very healthy. My understanding is that a part of this whole coronavirus and COVID-19 situation is if one has a very robust immune system, they're better able to fight off the infection, the virus, what, what have you. Um, was your immune system in any way compromised? Did the doctors tell you that? Or, or what did they say about your immune system? What, why it affected you so badly? Um, they didn't tell me. I read the report and there was there's no... At that early stage, there was no fixed underlying item that right. could come back. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could say to our community, because we haven't got a lot of sun here, and my mother would say it's called a cold sun here, <laughs> not a hot sun. Well, yes. You have to take vitamin D, D tablets that, to, mm. to boost your system. Yes. And that's the only advice I can give is have an oximeter and take vitamin D, D tablets, tablets just to mm. boost your system. Um, but there was no underlying thing at the current time. And I think mm. the, the main thing is, is that nowadays... They don't uh, cut your throat to put mm -hmm. a, to clear your airways. They'll oh. give you an oxygen bag uh, to actually force the oxygen down. Down, okay, right. So you, you can see you know. now that there's little, mm -hmm. an oxygen bag over somebody's head, then they're breathing in, it, in, right. in a bag mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. it, it's oxygenated mm -hmm. uh, from, mm -hmm. from that aspect, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me ask you then, um, Wade, 
after going through this ordeal, and, and this is an ordeal, and, and you don't mind me saying it, you, you were on death's door. There's no doubt in my mind from having heard before and hearing you speak now on New Style Radio. Um, what's your perspective on life now? My perspective on life, uh, I have to live each day as if it's my last. And, and, I, and my, my friends and colleagues know that I, I, I'd live it up in the sense that I don't go to parties, I don't drink yes. and all the rest, mm -hmm. but I try and put a lot of things in, in my day. So, you know, I'm always doing, thinking of, of the next things to do. And, and what I, I say to all my friends, I said, look, I'm happy to be alive. Mm -hmm. um, and don't be afraid if I say thank you, please, mm -hmm. spend my money on you and whatever, mm -hmm. because that's the way I am, because tomorrow may not be around. And I always say, mm -hmm. you know, make hay while the sun, sun shines. shines. Yes, I agree. And for me, it's a second lease of mm -hmm. life, I should mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm trying to do is save one person. If I can save one person. You've done. Mm -hmm. I've done my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I know what everybody's saying is, you know, it's you shouldn't take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate I've had the two. I've oh, had the had two. Both now. Mm -hmm. Both now, the mm -hmm. Pfizer vaccine. Um, when I suffer from the corona, I did have the antibodies in your system. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the, the female of the community, they're the ones that I would class will have probably picked it up but won't show any symptoms. Right. And somebody mm. told me a 94-year-old mother, grandmother, mm. had COVID. They didn't know she had I the did. COVID mm. until she was tested. Wow. Um, and I should say, it might not be sexist, but the, I think the females in our community mm -hmm. may be asystematic and the younger people... I see. ...are going to be asystematic. For the people who don't understand what asystematic is all about, mm -hmm. it's the individuals that don't show any symptoms, symptoms. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. have the virus mm -hmm. and will spread it to other people who may not have had the vaccine right. and may not be able to, to survive mm -hmm. um, about of COVID. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem that we're going to have now is that the strain of the corona may increase at a higher level. Right. So we had the Kent variant, we had the variant from South Africa, and you mm -hmm. really shouldn't call it the South African variant yeah. because it's the country. Uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. then you've got the Brazilian variant that's mm -hmm. obviously here. Mm -hmm. And as, um, as our Prime Minister said, what takes place in Europe is going to wash up on our shores. So, that, that's where, mm -hmm. yeah. so mm -hmm. the, the main thing you will understand, if you don't take the coronavirus, vaccine mm -hmm. um if if you do catch it you may obviously come down far worse than i did and may not survive right. yeah mm -hmm. now if in your community you take the flu jab mm -hmm. the corona is like the flu jab mm -hmm. and you will be taking booster jabs mm -hmm. going forward for the next three to five years yes. I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned the flu jab there, um, Wade, because I, with my type 2 diabetes, controlled strictly by diet, I'll hasten to add to the viewers and listeners, and um, physical activity. For the last 18 years, it runs in my family, I take the winter flu jab every year. So I'm going to be saying loud and clear to listeners, that is what you need to be doing. The same with, you've had your two vaccines, myself and my wife, we've had our first, the end of April, we're due to have the second. And, and I would encourage me, be encouraging people to do this. I'm gonna come back to the vaccine in a minute, but I want to talk about the power of prayer. Lots of prayers were said for your recovery. Um, you're a very popular man, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't realize how popular you are. Uh, are you by nature, the question I'm asking here, a religious person? And if so, have you been able to thank your savior for the miracle of, of, of healing you? Um, I could say, yes, I'm a religious person because 
when I go, when my mother is here or I'm in Jamaica, we have to go to, to church, church together. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I go to a little church in Chapelton that my mum goes to. Mm -hmm. Obviously, churches haven't been opened mm -hmm. for me to go to church, but I have to say to everybody, thank you for praying for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy to go to anybody's church to stand up to and say... Testimony. Testimony mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the vaccine... You need to take the vaccine. Mm. And this is real. And it is real. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a lot of people in the UK mm -hmm. who don't want to take the vaccine. But let me give you a few home truths. The people in Jamaica have the vaccine and there's a 100% take up. Mm -hmm. Over here, you may think you, that you may not want to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But in Jamaica, there's only one vaccine currently available with a ship from India, yeah, yeah. which is the... Um, Oxford Zeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. They don't have a choice which the Pfizer, the Johnson and Johnson, mm -hmm. or the the other one coming on stream. So let's get it clear. In Jamaica, there's a hundred percent take up. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. My mother at nineties had hers. Right. My sister and brothers in their sixties mm -hmm. have gone for the first vaccine. Mm -hmm. I did contact the High Commission down in London and the UK can only ship out fifty thousand. Right. Bearing in mind any vaccines made in the UK mm -hmm. will be for the UK population Nation. first mm -hmm. and Europe. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can add to that way that my wife's sister and her husband, who live in St. Catherine, they are journeying to the National Arena, which arena, which is next to the National Stadium, today as we speak, to get their first dose of the vaccine. The, the, the importance of it cannot be underestimated. And, and that's the reason you're here um, doing this show with us. I'm now going to take a short break so Wade can catch his breath. And we're going to play You Can Get It If You Really Want It. It's a next show featuring Honor Great Council Wade Lynn on New Style Radio um, this Sunday. I'm Tony Kelly, your host, and you've just heard Desmond Decker singing You Can Get It If You Really Want It. That's Desmond Decker and the Israelites. Now, back to Wade. Let's continue this journey. Um, I'm loving your choice of music, Wade. It's, it's bringing me back to my time spent in Jamaica as a young man, as a boy and a young man. Re really uplifting music. Um, let's go back now to, um, you said earlier that you've had both doses, which is fine. But I'm going to move on to a, a very controversial area. In some aspects, some areas of Britain, they start showing that black people, and when I'm talking black people, I'm talking African, Caribbean, and Asian people, are hesitant or reluctant to take the vaccine, okay? What would you say to that? How would you try, I'm gonna be devil's advocate. They talk about conspiracy theories, they talk about changing of the DNA within a person, they talk about chips inside a person, they talk about wanting to kill off the black race. You name it, they've all been said out there. I won't even repeat some of the others. They're so weird and wonderful that I see them on, they come on my WhatsApp and I just delete them straight away. What would you say to convince doubters, anti-vaxxers, people are hesitant or reluctant. Over to you, Wade. How can we change the narrative? Um, I've heard some of the narratives that there are, if you have a vial, there are six chips in the vial. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get it clear. <laughs> if you're the number six person, are you going to get no chips or one right. chip? <laughs> but let's put it clear. If you all got a mobile phone, there's a chip in your mobile <laughs> phone. Absolutely. All right. Mm. So, so let's, 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 let's uh, put that out of your your head that there's no chips mm -hmm. in a particular vial mm -hmm. okay um also it's not a vaccine that it's aimed at the dna of the afro-caribbean people not so not so the case mm -hmm. so there isn't six come in a box and there's one specially mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. you know so let's let's get it clear um i know that people have discussed in the they did some trials with the the black people in America way back in the the 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm, I'm saying it from the sense that I've lived again, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell you that take the vaccine, um, and I, the amount of people I talk and say, well, I'm not taking the vaccine because I want to see everybody else's. 
Uh, my aunt who suffers from sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. she spoke to a nurse and she told them to take the Oxford vaccine, which is less potent. If you do take the vaccine, you will have mild effect as if you had the flu for mm -hmm. two or three days. They will be a small proportion, one in 100,000, mm -hmm. that may su suffer adverse it's reaction, mm -hmm. but that is the same proportion as having a car accident. Mm -hmm. Or any other medication for that matter. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if you look at your medication, mm -hmm. bit of paper that comes mm -hmm. with it, says you mm -hmm. suffer from uh, headaches, dizziness, mm -hmm. please don't drive. Mm -hmm. But if you put all of those papers together, they all say the same Anything. thing. Yes. So... I've had side effects on the first vaccine mm -hmm. um, and I didn't read the paperwork. And if you're going to take the vaccine, take two paracetamols mm -hmm. as soon as you have the vaccine or just before. Mm -hmm. um, you have to wait in the vaccination centre for 15, 20 minutes to confirm that you have, haven't had any adverse yes, reaction. reaction. Okay. The biggest problem that is going to be about, excuse me, as mm -hmm. I said before, if you're asystematic and you don't know that you are COVID positive mm -hmm. and you go and have the vaccine, what the vaccine does, it gives you a second shot of COVID, mm -hmm. which might cause you to have more of an adverse re reaction with mm -hmm. the COVID. So you're already carrying the COVID mm -hmm. uh, bacteria, but then you get another shot of it and it may cause you to go into seizures, blood clots, and mm -hmm. possibly die. Right. And that's okay. a small proportion. Okay. My only problem I've got, if you don't take the vaccine, is from tomorrow when the community opens up, mm -hmm. the people around mm -hmm. you, and you still have to wear your face mask, mm -hmm. wear your gloves, mm -hmm. and sanitise nice, on a regular yeah, basis, basis. Mm -hmm. because as Chile has now had a problem that uh, Israel mm -hmm. was top of the world right, yes. in vaccinating mm -hmm. all of their population, yeah, followed mm -hmm. by Chile, followed by the UK. Mm -hmm. When Chile opened up, people had parties mm -hmm. and the virus now spread and they're now in the third wave. Mm -hmm. Now, Jamaica was shut down over Easter. Mm -hmm. Now, the Prime Minister didn't want to shut the Jamaican uh, country down mm -hmm. because Easter... Friday and Easter Sunday mm -hmm. is very high yeah, up on our calendar Sunday, at, yes. at the very top. But he was more concerned that he wanted to save lives mm -hmm. and stop people from mixing mm -hmm. and spreading it. So understand that as from tomorrow, mm -hmm. you will run a high risk mm -hmm. if you haven't had the vaccine of picking up the COVID mm -hmm. and actually been hospitalized right okay well here's a supplementary question for you in the earlier days people didn't even know well do i have it or don't i have it as of last week the government has made it available for those who so wish to do is to twice a week get either sent to their home or go to a pharmacy or so on the actual testing kit which within 20 minutes can confirm whether they are covid free or that they have COVID. What's your take on that? Um, should people try and get these kits that are out there? Those are the fast flow tests. For, yes, that's what it's called, yeah. Um, my, my take on this, anybody in my workforce, if I suspect they've got COVID, mm -hmm. I will send them up to, to the nearest testing station, okay. mm -hmm. whether it could be just off the Dudley Road or just a walk-in pharmacy across the road from the station. Mm -hmm. So... If in doubt, go for a test, yes, right. no matter how small. So mm -hmm. we've had a, float, a couple of close calls whereby engineers have turned up. He's had COVID. We've checked on our camera system. We sanitise out all the areas. Mm -hmm. And I have been for a COVID test twice since I've been out okay. to confirm that I didn't pick up the infection of a third party. Right, right. okay. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned your staff in, in that a bit there. Have your staff on the whole and their families followed your lead and taken the vaccine? Well, as many people as followed my lead, uh, so Ken, my, um, my engineering gentleman, is the same 
same doctors as had two of his vaccine. Mm -hmm. And Monica, uh, my secretary for the consular, has taken mm -hmm. her, and many people has taken the vaccine. But for me, I don't know anybody in my organisation that may have refused to take mm -hmm. the vaccine. I see. Uh -huh. uh, at our factory, we air change the air every 20 minutes. Right. So mm -hmm. we have an air changing for fans are running. Mm -hmm. Whenever anybody's in, in, in change of rooms, offices, mm -hmm. production area, to mm -hmm. make sure there's filtered fresh air coming in all the mm -hmm. time. Now, that's an important question you raise about filtered fresh air. You're into um, flying a lot, going off to the Caribbean and places like that. How is that going to impact us in aeroplanes with that air in the aeroplane? Will, 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 will people be able to travel? Um, yeah. Nobody has so, ever answered that for me, I've asked it, but okay. people said we don't know. So, Can you shed some light? Yeah, shed some light. What happens is on, on a plane, the air intake on a, on a plane that, obviously, the air intake engines, mm -hmm. um, they take air in from the air intake engines into the cabin and mm -hmm. they can mix hot and cold air that mm -hmm. comes through the cabin. So, mm -hmm. there is a mixture system that's there that comes through but you have to wear your face mask all the time because you're in a confined area, area. but yes. mm -hmm. um, the captain or the regulation will stipulate how much fresh air is coming in mm -hmm. and the, what you call the air changes per hour okay at this juncture we're going to take a short break and um, while, while we're on the break in terms of adverts You'll also be hearing Three Little Birds by Bob Marley. You notice Birmingham's the running theme? number one for African arts, culture, and Afro edutainment. edutainment. 98.7 New Style FM. New style. Welcome back. Welcome back, viewers and listeners, to New Style Radio 98.7 FM. Um, I don't know if we've scared you, but nobody has yet rung in on the studio number 0121 270 2559 to give us a take either way about what our special guest, Honorary Counsel Wade Lynn, is telling us about his near death experience and the need and the urgency for us all as black people to take the um, vaccine. One thing I must mention is his choice of songs um, Many Rivers to Cross, um, Don't Worry About a Thing. You can get it if you really want it. You notice this theme running through. Um, it's so apt and appropriate. Um, my boy Lollipop, um, young, gifted, and black. You, you, you can't get better than these, I'm afraid. Right. So let me move on then to ask you, Wade. Vaccination passports is high on the agenda at the moment, especially if people want to travel or if people want to go into the pub or the club or wherever. Um, give us your view on vaccination passports and, and what your thoughts on that please i think you will need a vaccination passport um i know you everybody has to t have um what they call um travel insurance mm -hmm. but i suspect the travel insurance company will will there'll be a question or you'll be asked a question if have you had your vaccination yet mm -hmm. now let's let's put it this way you haven't had any vaccination you go to another country, mm -hmm. you catch COVID in that country. Imagine the situation where the hospitals are full, you're a foreign resident, mm -hmm. you can't talk the language, mm -hmm. you haven't got the network in which to get into the hospital, uh, yes, no. your chances are going to fall down at the very bottom of the list. So mm -hmm. let's understand that. So mm -hmm. if you intended to travel in the next two years, mm -hmm. I suggest you take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But also... Um, you've got to take the vaccine for your loved ones around you. Important. The, mm -hmm. the people closest to you, all right, will or may suffer if you don't take the vaccine because mm -hmm. when I was ill, uh, my daughter had to start the funeral arrangements already because I'd already written down exactly what was going to take place. Wow. So they'd already started mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. already back at work. Mm. So it was scary times. Yes, so, indeed. Mm. so for me, fortunate now, I've just got to tidy up the estate. Right. Um, put it in good hands. Put yeah. it in good hands. Mm. Buy your plot mm -hmm. in the cemetery. Um, pay for your funerals through the co-op. Yes. Because they're going to be around maybe in 20 years' time. Um, so yes. mm -hmm. pay for all of that. 
Um, and I always say to everybody, I know when you pass away, the, the people you leave behind, because you are dead and gone, let's get it clear, mm -hmm. you leave the headache behind. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so my, my, my thing as the honorary consul is, please make a will and make your wishes clear yes. how you want the money you leave behind yeah, spent. Yes, indeed. Because there's mm -hmm. nothing worse than not leaving a will mm -hmm. and there's infighting mm -hmm. between family members to yes. say, I should have got this, mm -hmm. she should have got that, mm -hmm. I did this for mum, I did this for mm -hmm. dad, mm -hmm. I've been working all this time. Yes. And please, mm -hmm. make a will, no matter how old or young you are, mm -hmm. For the little things so if you want to give your toys away mm -hmm. as you know give your yes. toys to mm -hmm. your best friend or whatever so yes. just mm -hmm. do that for me please I, I, I like that because even the duke of edinburgh who passed away recently apparently he said loud and clear he didn't want this whole heap of gra well covid has put pay to that anyway but he didn't want any grand um um sort of celebration and so on um, for his for his funeral, he wanted it to be kept um, very simple and dignified. All right, let's get back to this and ask you: Have you had to at all change your diet and physical activity since you're recovering from your illness? Has there been any diet changes or things you put in place physical activity-wise? Okay, let's get it clear. Once you go into uh, a coma, mm -hmm. uh, you start to lose weight, Wait, so you're yes. on a liquid lunch. Yes. So when I uh, woke up, I'd lost two stones. Wow. Um, I've since put that on and put a few extra pounds on. on. Yeah. Um, so my diet is, I've got to have less saturated fats and everything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, I've had to do a lot more walking. Um, my feet are tingling at the moment mm. because I haven't moved them around. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the key things is, the more walking exercise I do, the fitter I get. Get, right, okay. Mm. Right. Um, uh, there's a caller on the line. We, we'll have him stand by, or her stand by. Just finish off on, on the... So, so, so the, the, the side effects that you will have if you do catch COVID is obviously feeling tired in the afternoon. Right. Um, and, and you're going to have to do more exercise. Um, at the moment, I could say my upper body is a little bit stronger. So mm -hmm. it's all in the mind, but not in the body. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So my legs are still a bit weaker. Mm -hmm. And the problem you're going to get if you do get COVID if you exercise, it's like mm. having a battery. You do too much one day and it'll take you another two days to recover. Oh, right. Mm. So you only but can do slowly but surely. Yes. 70 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or 80 percent. But if you get to 90 percent, 100 percent, like I did last weekend, had a little bit of walk and was out for two hours after right. I had a walk around mm. the block. Uh, right. I, I am very much into physical activity, as you know, Wade. And um the gym's reopen tomorrow. Yip, yip, hooray, the 12th of April. So I'll be able to start doing all the stuff that I do at the gym. But we have a caller on the line. Hello, caller. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Tony. Good evening. Good evening, Tony. Hello, who is this? I won't say my name immediately. <laughs> oh, you won't say your name. I'm trying to. I know so many people I can't get. I, I think I recognize the voice, but I don't want to say. Anyway, go on, caller. What, what do you have no, to no, ask no. Wade? Wade Lee, no I special will, guest. I will, my, I will say my name, but I said I won't say it immediately. <laughs> good evening, good evening. And I'm glad, I'm glad to have someone like Wade Lynn encouraging people to take the vaccine because I have taken my first vaccine. Good on you. In January, January 31st. My question to Wade, two questions, or two questions. One, um, why has it taken so long for me to be called to take my second vaccine, which I'm anxious to take, my second, my second job? And the oximeter, at what level should one be comfortable with the reading on the oximeter? And I ask this because I have had, unfortunately, to be going to the hospital um, so I've gone to the hospital about six times in the last four months. Mm -hmm. And um, each time I was checked with the oximeter and I checked my reading between 90 and 143. Why the gap between 90 and 143? Am I in danger at 90? And also I was tested about six times since November. 
and on my discharge sheet every time is written asymptomatic. From what way said earlier, does that mean that I might have COVID without realizing? Okay, there's a lot there. Wade, Wade will try his best now to answer. Okay. By the way, Tony, it, it, Tony it's, it's Lloyd. Lloyd Blake. Blake. Yes, I knew it was Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, um, just a second. Now, do you mean your um, blood pressure machine, not an oximeter? Yeah. Uh, this is at the hospital, not home. OK. Right, at the hospital, the the blood pressure machine will give you a low reading and a high reading. And it's normally 40 points between the low reading and the high reading. So an average blood pressure reading would be the low at 80 and the upper is 120. That's correct. OK. Mm -hmm. okay. I, was, I was between 90... 120 on one stage, and on one occasion they said you need 143. Then I must have been overexcited, and it came down to 123. No, that's fine. That's fine. The oximeter measures you from zero to 100. Okay. So that's totally different, okay. and that's put on your finger and not on your um, cuff, your arm. At what level? At what level? What level of the oximeter then between one and another? Okay, so, so if you've got readings in the 90s, you are all right. So between 94 and 99, you shouldn't worry too much about. But if it drops below 90 and goes into the 80s, that's when you should get worried about. Okay. So a colleague of mine who got an oximeter for somebody in America... They took all the family, wrote them all down, and the father in the family started to drop below 90, then he dropped into the 80s, uh -huh. and as soon as he dropped below 80, 70, the, they took him to the hospital, and they saved his life. And that's, that's as simple as, as I, can, I, I can put it. Well, as you know, as you know, Wade, I was one of those who was following you when you were there, and you remember I spoke to you at Rehabilitation Centre, and thank Whoever we pray to, I'm not pro religious myself, but give thanks that you're here. I've had to go to be going to the hospital since November because of um, hemorrhoidal bleeding yeah. um, around my hemorrhoids. Um, thankfully, nothing more serious. I've had to do a colonoscopy. At one stage, I was dropped down to 80 and had to be given five units of blood. Wow. I'm taking it, I was in. Not too far from where you might have been. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so just for the people outside listening in, it's the oxygen that's in your bloodstream. So, as the oxygen yes. uh, de depletes out of your bloodstream and your probably lungs start to fill up with water, yes, um, the oxygen level drops below eighty. So you are getting pneumonia or such in, on your lungs, the water in your lungs, and that's why yeah. they turn me over onto the tummy to try and flush the water out yeah. of my lungs yeah. to, to survive. And, you know, I've, I've had a, my electrician who died in hospital and he had the same problem that was trying to get the oxygen um, into his lungs and the water off his lungs, which is pneumonia. Yeah. So... Understand what I'm, I'm telling our community is take the vaccine because it's a lesser of two evil. Yes, I'd agree. Totally. I, I'm, I've joined you, I'm joining you, I've joined you, and a lot of other persons out here to say, yes, all the theorists can say what the heck they want to yes, say, but mm, yes. people are dying from this thing, uh, and I join you in going yes, for the vaccine. Uh, Lloyd, we're going to end here now, but I want to ask you one thing very quickly. How come if you had this thing, the first one from January, we're now into April, you, you, you're a very assertive man. You're supposed to be asking your, um, your, your GP. G GP or whoever, why have you not been called for dose number two? Cause <laughs> I, asked, I asked my GP twice this week, um, Tony. And? And what they, 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 they told me on both occasions was they are waiting for a list to come to them in which I would be placed, because as you may know, I'm close to 80 years of age, and I don't take risk like this with these things. And on both occasions this week, they said to me, we are waiting for a list to come 
between now and the end of April. And I ask, why January 31st do I have to be waiting beyond the second week in April? It, it, it's something's not right there. You need you need to. We need to end this call now, Lloyd. Because um, but but you need to follow through with that because I'll be on, I'll be on tweet from tomorrow morning, following what Wade has been saying. Say, just now. Indeed, indeed. And you know you have my number as well if if needs be. Okay. No, no, thanks for calling in, Lloyd. Um, much appreciated. Um, I'll take one more question before we go to another um, line of music, and it is, um, what in your life would you say? Wait, sort of wanting to sort of end on a positive is the highlight. What, what's been the highlight? You, you've, you've been there, done it, worn the t shirt. Um, what's the most important thing you'd say in your life on earth so far? I think the highlight is being alive now. I think if I, if I had to say to everybody, is having, is having uh, the four right or the four C mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm alive now and I can live a few more years more and that's what i'm saying to everybody so take the vaccine because it will extend your life and you know i'm not saying it because i'm alive now i'm saying it because i want to help other people and i don't want them to suffer because i've seen two of my closest friends mm -hmm. enter hospital and catch the covid mm -hmm. and have since passed away so it is something that's out there and it will be in our society for the next few years. Yes, yes it's not going anywhere. And it's yeah. not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you decide to stay indoors for the next two years mm -hmm. and don't come out, you stand a good chance of not catching it. But if you do come out, mm -hmm. you may stand and you may stand it and you may will, will pick it up. Right. That's a positive note to end on. We're coming to the end of this two hour show. Time has flown. Um, Wade, I'm going to thank you very much for coming in to New Style Radio 98.7 FM and sharing your story with us. It, it, it is truly a remarkable story. Um, you mentioned earlier to me, if you convince one person to change their mind and save one person's life, you think you'd have done your job. I, I'm hoping the listeners will take on board what you have been saying. It was a pleasure speaking to you. I've known you for quite a while now, and your team down at your um, workplace, Monica Coke in particular, I have to big her up. Um, continue on the road to recovery. Stay blessed, walk good, and we're gonna end with a final track you chose, and this one is, this is the land of my birth. Gosh, this brings me back. Eric Donaldson, Mr. Festival himself from Jamaica. This is the land of my birth. <laughs>